one of my teaching colleagues is here. Is, he said I should just use my teaching voice, so hopefully that will work. Um, and by the time Steve is up here, we can have uh, the mic set up. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And uh, I was, you know, some people braving the cold. I, I didn't think we'd have the numbers we would from last time because it was a bit chillier, but it's good. We wanted to see who is really serious here. And now we got it. <laughs> um, no, I know some people said they couldn't make it tonight, so we will be posting uh, some of the information that we provide online tonight. Um, what's going to happen, you guys would have saw a little bit of an agenda on the Facebook page if you were there. Again, if you haven't already, uh, joining that Facebook group, it's just Regina Solar Co-op would be a good idea. And uh, again, those of you who were not here uh, two weeks ago, uh, my name is Josh Campbell. And I, uh, I got the idea to do this, uh, get this going after watching uh, Al Gore's recent documentary, An Inconvenient Sequel, which I believe is showing at the university tonight, so we're competing with Al Gore. <laughs> if you really want to do something, you should be here, not watching the movie, but no. um, it, it is a good film. And it, it did kind of light a fire in my uh, wife and I to uh, do something more. And, and then I looked up Regina Sol Solar Co-ops and I saw Susan Burley's name. And Susan uh, had a meeting months ago and, and I met some of you tonight were at that meeting. So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Susan unfortunately is in South America, so she isn't with us tonight. Um, but uh, Stephen and I are going to be talking a bit more about the next steps. Uh, we are really encouraged by the amount of people that were here uh, two weeks ago. Uh, as I said, there was some standing room only almost here. That uh, just shows you how much interest there is in solar. Um, so that was very exciting. Uh, we, those of you who weren't here, uh, just a small recap. We talked about two different models. Uh, one is uh, one is a more large scale solar model, uh, and an example of that is seen in Saskatoon. And some of you who were at Susan's meeting she had months ago will know about that. She had a person come talk about that. And we also uh, talked a little bit about um, a Washington D.C. model that was uh, more of people uh, coming together as a group to create consumer power to. Uh, uh, to basically have solar put on their own individual homes. And so that was a model that uh, about, I think 50% of the people who were at the last meeting we were looking at the results said they were interested in that model. 25% said the, uh, the uh, large scale model. And I think what we decided when we sat down with the group, uh, the group of us, Susan, Stephen and I, is that um, a hybrid model is actually pretty attractive and maybe a very good idea to look at a way that we can combine both a large and a small scale um, solar co-op. So we're, we're looking at that. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We have some exciting possibilities with, with people that we're talking to uh, about more of a large scale model. There's going to be some options there and I'm guessing some of you who may determine that I'm not ready for solar on my own house, but I really want to get involved in this. That'll give you a good option to look at. And uh, and so I, obviously those are people who aren't homeowners, renters, uh, people who may be in apartments or condos. There is going to be options for you as well. We want to make that, make that space. And then there's a lot of people here who are homeowners and are excited about uh, getting solar up on their own home. So those are those are the things we talked about last time. We want to move forward. And uh, Stephen is going to talk a little bit about um, what does it mean to be solar ready um, as someone who has uh, had solar up on his uh, on his house for a couple years. Um, he's also going to talk about. Uh, there was a, an article in the Leader Post, and there was some reaction there. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, I don't think the mic is there. That's one. Okay. So and then and then uh, I will finish, and we'll talk about what are the next steps as we go forward. So go ahead. <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people were here uh, a couple weeks ago for the presentation? Okay. So, for those of you who weren't here, um, just a quick explanation of why uh, that presentation was called uh, Looking Forward 2059, just so you have a little bit of context. Um, uh, I have young kids, don't let this fool you. Um, uh, so right now, uh, my eldest is 11 and, and my youngest is 8, but when my, um, young, my eldest was 8, so three years ago, uh, is when I first started looking into uh, solar. And I realized at that time that um, when my 8-year-old uh, was going to be my age, and at the time I was 53, the year would be 2059. And so I was, I was thinking a lot about that year because I was thinking about my daughter, my eldest daughter, and the fact that she would be my age in 2059, my age three years ago. So that's what sort of started the journey. Um, so the presentation, uh, I thought, would, while we had, as Josh said, we had a good turnout and there was some good questions and so on. Um, the next day there was an article, actually later that night, it came out in the online version. The next day there was an article in the Leader Post. Um, and is Ashley Martin here? Ashley here. here. Yeah. So Ashley wrote the article, Ashley's the leader post. Um, I thought it was a good article. Uh, we chatted earlier in the day, and I thought it captured uh, you know, everything that I was trying to convey about really the economic case for solar. Um, there was definitely, uh, the reason I got into it was for my kids, and so there was definitely for me um, the motivation, the original motivation was, um, was environmental. Well, really, it was, it was just care for my kids and you know, thinking, well, I should be doing something. But very quickly, after, especially after three years of experience with the system, I realized that actually there's a very, very strong economic case for solar. And I, I, that's the case I was trying to make a couple of weeks ago. Um, there some interesting comments in the comments section. They say don't read the comments, but I did. Uh, and so this fellow said, um, uh, after reading the argument, said he paid almost 30000 plus financing and interest fees to say $15 a month. Anyone who thinks that's an economic benefit would probably benefit from taking a few more economics classes. <laughs> <laughs> Zinc. <laughs> wow, that, that kind of hurt a little bit. Uh, but um, I wrote back to clarify. <laughs> Um, really, you know, have the opportunity to expand on some things that uh, that actually was a little bit constrained. Uh, in you know, I'm sure her editors are you know writing you out these key words. Go, you know, go for it. It's a bit more complex, but I sort of unpacked it a bit for him and uh, tried to sort of uh, uh, describe. No, no, actually, because the misunderstanding was that that my power bill and a few other people saw this as well. The misunderstanding was that my power bill had only dropped by. $15 a month, even though I'd spent, it was actually 23000 after the rebate, so the number's right. So I did spend, our family did spend $23,000, um, but the misperception was that, oh, you spent all that money and your power bill only dropped by $13 a, a month. Well, no, actually, when I talk about my cost of power, I talk about the cost for our family to have electricity, the entire cost of that. Okay, my power bill has actually dropped by about 150 or something dollars a month. I, I barely buy any power. Now. I'm still connected to the grid. I still need SAS power to provide me power when I'm not producing it. And we have an arrangement where I'm trading kilowatt hours and so on. But anyway, so I explained it and happily, actually, I got some nice sort of responses from people who had sent some snarky things. And there's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And one of them was this. He said, well, you know, he said, that's less than 15 years to pay off the investment. That's not fantastic, but it's reasonable. It was quite a, a civil kind of uh, discussion that we had. And I was really pleased about that. Um, but then I, I was really kind of drawn to this. So 15 years to pay off the investment. And I, I have to say that, honestly, and this is just, you know, I've been struggling with this actually ever since this article. I didn't really think of it as an investment. I mean, I, you know, I told that to my wife. She's no, of course it's like, people aren't going to understand this. Like, but I didn't. I really didn't. It didn't make sense for me to look at it that way. Because, because of this. Because before, right, without solar, I was paying 186 bucks a month. That wasn't an investment. That was the cost to get electricity. It wasn't an investment. I wasn't investing money. That wasn't part of my investment contributions on a monthly basis. That was how much I paid for electricity. And now I'm paying $173 a month. 
13 bucks a month less, and that includes capital cost repayment, and I was very transparent about this, 4% is what I calculated over 25 years, which is the guaranteed life of the panels, plus the extra power that I do need. I admitted I need about, on average, 20 bucks a month. I need to buy from SAS Power, plus the SAS Power admitted taxes. For me, it wasn't an investment versus an investment. It was a cost for electricity on a monthly basis versus a cost for electricity on a monthly basis. That was it. So I struggled with this. Um, I struggled with this because for me, it was like, well, I got this thing, and now I'm paying 13 bucks a month less, and I don't know, that makes sense to me. I will concede that it's an asset. So I thought, okay, well, I, you know, Three years ago, I didn't have those solar panels on, on the roof of my garage. And so it's like, okay, I was struggling thinking about it as an investment because I didn't really approach it from that perspective, but it's clearly an asset. It's something that, that adds some value to my house. And so I looked into, it's like, well, how much value does it add to my house? I've added this thing to, to my studio. How much, how much does it increase the value of my property? I couldn't find anything for Canada. Now, this is two years ago that I was, I was digging around trying to do this. Um, originally, and I found this article in the New York Times from February 20, 2015. Now, um, this article was really about this study that was done at the Lawrence Berkeley National uh, Laboratory, um, and it examined sales data for 23,000 homes in eight states in the, in the United States. They were all homes where the systems were owned, not leased, so, so um, lease has a different kind of uh, value valuation on the home, but Anyway, the researchers found that buyers were willing to pay a premium of $15,000 for a home with an average size of solar photovoltaic system of 3.6 kilowatts, or 3,600 watts, compared to a home without Okay, so it's a pretty big study, pretty, pretty reliable study, 23,000 homes in eight states. Um, <coughs> and at the end of the day, they say that uh, there is a willingness to pay 15 grand for a home or for a home with this system. Here's the key line here. Put another way, that translates to about four additional dollars per watt of solar power. Okay. That it's added to the value of your home. Okay, well, that's data from the states, and I'm not gonna pretend to say that you know it's all that reliable, but I don't have data for Canada. I've asked the Real Estate Association, I've asked realtors, hey, can you guys think about this? It's good information to have. For people who, like me who have solar and want to know what's the impact on my home. But this is the only data I've got right now. So I'll, let's run through that number for, for a moment to appraise the asset value of this thing that I've added to my home that provides me with power that costs 13 bucks a month less than I used to pay. So again, that's the important thing for me. But okay, let's let's talk, let's think of it as an investment. Does it, does it work as an investment? So let's appraise its value. It's a six point. So the 7.65 kilowatt system, that's 7,650 watts, okay? So that's all the panels on there produce that much power at their peak. Um, using that number of four bucks a watt, um, the, the value it adds to, to my uh, property, 30,600, okay? Uh, so 30,600, by the way, uh, after rebate, I paid 23,000, so that's seven grand more than we paid for after we got the rebate. So, like, okay, I think that's not a bad investment, actually. Um, Where's the downside? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still looking. You know. <laughs> um, okay, so, so that's one way of looking at the investment. Here's another one. And this way is more compelling to me, actually. This one's really, I got really excited when I sort of realized this. And it's, it's about investing in savings. So 13 bucks a month doesn't seem like that much. But uh, talk to any RSP planner or any investment counselor, and of course they will guide you to say a little bit counts and put it away and compound interest and magic and compound interest and all of that stuff. You know about. Okay, so we save thirteen dollars a month on electricity. In March of 2018, that price, uh, that, that that savings is going to go up because if I had my old system, I'd be paying more because SAS Power has said that they're pushing for a five percent rate increase. In, Jan in sorry March of 2018, okay. and I'm of the opinion that that's really just that this year's rate increase. We're going to be seeing them more and more and more. The reason for that, just very quickly, is that our infrastructure is desperately in need of, of um, refurbishment and upgrading and all of that. SAS Power has 
we a few years ago received the okay to spend a billion dollars a year in infrastructure upgrade. So just to service a billion dollar increase in, uh, in that, it's going to be a 3% increase. And so you can guarantee that there's going to be a 3% increase and probably there's going to be a few percent increase more. And as I mentioned in uh, the presentation a few weeks ago, if the tax, um, if the carbon tax comes in, when the carbon tax comes in, that's going to increase that as well. So we're going to see increases in the cost of power in the, into the foreseeable future. So we save 13 bucks a month now, but it's going to go up. Uh, it's going to increase as the cost of power increases. I'll be saving more money, right? Because uh, my, the old way, I would have, I would have paid more. If I had more to invest. We can invest those savings, okay? We can invest those savings. Now again, the life of the system is 25 years. So if I say, if I sort of project in the future, and I project 5% increases in the cost of power annually, okay? Um, which I, again, I think is pretty reasonable. Um, and if we say, well, let's compound it at a pretty, pretty uh, conservative rate, 4% compounded annually. Okay, and if I, if I put that aside, and I put that in a savings fund, a solar savings investment fund, after the 25 years, $58,124, and our solar system would be paid off, of course. Because that's, that's, what, that's, what that's the money that I save, and I put in investments and do good. So, is this an investment? I think it is. I think it is. I think it makes sense. I get, I get power that's cheaper the whole way long. I get an investment, that, I get an asset that adds value to my house, and I get savings uh, between what I could have paid to what I am paying that I can invest in a fund and that can grow over time. So sure, it's an investment and I actually think the math makes sense. Um, okay, so I just wanted to do a quick recap on that because that article, uh, you know, I, I just felt like the conversation needed to keep going. I, I don't like I don't like it when people sort of shut it down, shut something down on really frankly some misperceptions. It's like, well let's just talk this through. I think we can explain this. Okay. Tonight's presentation is a little bit different. So tonight, um, I'm calling this one taking off the training wheels. That's my youngest there. That's uh, the day after she got her training wheels off on a beautiful sunny evening in Saskatchewan. And the purpose of this is to move uh, really folks who are interested in this from being solar curious to solar serious. Okay. And I have to say there is a little bit of, of an urgency in this. And the reason for the urgency is because in um, November 2018, the uh, net metering program that SAS Power has, um, which is a great program, it's fantastic, it's 20% rebate on, um, on approved uh, expenses, uh, and the net metering program is one for one, one kilowatt. Um, you get a one kilowatt credit, um, uh, and you can pull that out at, at the same value that, it, that, that you put it in. In other words, um, right now a kilowatt hour is uh, valued at 13.74 cents per kilowatt hour. So when I when I overproduce and I send that to SAS Power, I get credited at that rate and then I spend at that rate. That's not the case in all jurisdictions. Sometimes that's different. Sometimes you don't get as much for the uh, for the uh, kilowatt hours that you're selling um, as as you have to pay for the ones you're buying. So it's a great program. So there's some urgency because if you guys, if anyone is interested in getting this, uh, benefiting from this program and getting involved in net metering, you kind of need to ramp up and get to a point where you can take advantage of that program before it may end in 2018. We don't know what's going to happen to it. I don't know what's going to happen to it. But we know that the current program is only really in place until 2018. So I really want to move uh, any, any of I want to move you along, try to give you some tools and some suggestions for how to do that, and we'll keep you connected in, through the co-op, uh, the Regina Co-op uh, Facebook page about this. From the last presentation I gave, if you only took this away, that's fine. Because what this demonstrates is that where we live is literally the epicenter of uh, solar production in Canada. It's the best place in Canada to live if you want to have solar power. I don't understand why this isn't more public knowledge. I really don't. I don't understand why this particular uh, uh, graphic doesn't get a whole lot more attention. I, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why 
in Regina that we don't commit to having a center of excellence for, uh, for solar technology. Why wouldn't we? We've got this amazing resource. It just doesn't make sense. But whatever. This is, this is the first thing you need to know. So we're in the orange zone, the dark orange zone. There, so that means we generate, uh, we can generate uh, between 1,300 and 1,400 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar. <coughs> if you have one kilowatt solar system, you can produce 13 to 1,400 kilowatt hours of electrical energy annually. Okay. Fantastic. It's excellent. So it's, a, it's a kind of an important little measure. Okay. Oops. Um, so I should have set this up a little bit. I'm, I'm proposing two things tonight. I want you to sort of, if you're serious about this, if you're serious about moving from solar curious to solar serious, you kind of have to do two things. You have to say two things to yourself. The first one is this. To help save money, I'm going to spend some of my time becoming energy literate. I'd love to say that here's five things you need to do, click, 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 and by the end of the evening you'll know exactly what uh, your system is going to be, what it's going to cost, how much energy you get. It's going to be different for everyone, and you need to invest a bit of time to become solar literate, and you want to do that because by doing that, you save uh, a solar vendor from having to lead you by the hand through them. And that's a really important part of what we're proposing. Uh, and it's part of the DC model. It's, it's, it's pre-educating yourself. A huge cost that these solar vendors uh, face, a huge portion of their cost, is in educating their clients. They call them soft costs. Okay? So if you come to a solar vendor, you say, I want solar in my house, he or she has to spend some time with you, they have to go to your house, they have to take uh, pictures of your panel, they have to check your system, they have to answer the gazillion questions you're going to have about solar, because you don't really understand how it works, and blah, blah, blah. And they have to recoup that cost somehow, okay? So the current rate of installed solar, the, the current cost of installed solar, right now, depending on the size of the system, it's about $3.50 an installed watt. Okay? It'll be more if your system is small or maybe hard to get to. It'll be less if your system is bigger and easier to get to. But, but let's say it's around 350, somewhere between maybe three and 350 uh, uh, dollars an installed one. A portion of that is going to be soft costs. So the solar vendor is going to have to recoup all that effort that he or she put into to helping you understand, going to your house, blah, 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 all this stuff. My guess is that it's between like 50 to 75 cents, maybe more. Okay. So part of the purpose of getting together as a group like this is to encourage each other, let's try to understand this, let's pre-educate ourselves so that when we go to these solar companies, we are in a position to be able to go, yeah, I know what this is about, I know how much I know how my system and he doesn't have to know all that. And that's part of the value proposition that we're gonna make to those solar vendors. It's like, no no no, you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time educating these people. We've got a bunch of people. They're already, they already know what they're doing. They already know what they need. It's going to, it's going to be a few questions that are specific to their needs, but overall, they're pretty educated. So that's, that's the first thing I want you to sort of commit to if you're really interested in this. The second thing is that to benefit from group buying power, I will aim to be in a position to finance my, finance my PV solar array by March 2018. Now that does seem like a little pushy, but honestly, if, if, if we're going to get people ready, and we're going to put a package together to approach solar vendors um, in time to benefit uh, and get under the under the wire, so to speak, we need to have that commitment to that momentum. So who here knows about Groupon? You know, you know about Groupon. So really, basically, what we're proposing is kind of a Groupon arrangement. If you go to Groupon and you say, I am going to buy uh, this chair. I'll commit to buying that chair for this amount of money and I put in my credit card number and if, if a number of people commit to buying that chair, it tips, right, and I get the deal. But in order for Groupon to be able to do that, they need that commitment ahead of time. They need to know that, well, okay, um, if there's some, that uh, commitment is solid. There's, I've got the credit card number, I've got the commitment in place. Okay? It's kind of the same thing. If we're gonna go to solar, solar vendors and say, we've got 30 people, we've got a, bundle of 30 contracts that you're going to, uh, that we want you to bid on in an RFP, okay, competitive. 
and give us a good price because these people already know uh, all about solar. You don't have to train them. You don't have to spend all that soft cost. So you give us a good price there. Give us a good price because now you're buying. You can you can make a commitment because you're buying 30 times as many panels and 30 times as much racking and all that stuff. But in order for that to work, there needs to be people in a position, a financial position, to make that commitment. So those are the things that I'm, I'm sort of asking of you to really give some hard thought. Okay. Oops. Okay. So two things. Uh, two things that, that are sort of part of your journey, if you will, to, toward that toward that sort of you know let's say end of March goal or March goal. First one is uh, research, research, research. Um, it's no use me saying that in half an hour I'm going to be able to tell you everything you need to know. It's, it's not going to happen. Okay. Um, when I was uh, interested in doing this for my family, I probably spent a couple of months every morning before I went to work reading articles, thinking about things, asking anyone that would talk to me about it. You know, I just spent time researching. And so I would encourage you to do the same. Okay. Uh, get involved. Uh, read the articles. Ask the question. Second thing is, start a file. Okay, both physical and a digital file. I think makes sense. And that file, uh, I'll get into it in a second, but it'll, it'll it'll be a place to kind of keep all this information because you're going to need it at some point. Okay, before you go forward. Okay, so we're going to look at six assessments. Okay, that you're going to start thinking about. The first is a roof and engineering assessment. Okay, kind of an obvious one for rooftop solar. So what kind of roof do you have? Uh, is it a metal roof? Is it an asphalt roof? Uh, you know, what kind of roof is it? Take a photo of it. Put it in your file. Put it in your, uh, in the, uh, yeah, put it in your file. Uh, how high is the roof? How easy is it to get to? Is it a two-story house, a three-story house? What, you know, are there circumstances that the vendor is going to have to keep in mind in order for, for uh, him to be able to get to that, to that roof? What condition is it in? How recently did you have the shingles changed? How long will it last? Okay, these are important questions. You don't want to put uh, a solar system on a, uh, a that's going to last 25 years on a roof that's going to need shingling in three years. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So you need to do some of that preliminary research. Uh, and do you have the site plan for the house plan? Or because um, the solar company is going to need to do kind of engineering drawings for putting that racking on your roof. So they're going to need that information. Okay, so if you can find it for them, again, you're trying to do that work for them. That's going to help get the deal. The second assessment is a solar assessment. Now, it's pretty straightforward in some respects. I mean, you can actually get these fancy devices that will give you very, very specific um, information. But uh, if you go online, there's different calculators. And again, it's going to be a little bit different. There's lots of things to consider. I can't, there's no panacea to this. But uh, the more work you can do to figure this out, the better. So which way do you, does your roof face? What's the slope of it? So if you look at my roof behind there, it was a 12-12 slope, okay? And so what that means is that it's really good for summertime solar. Um, winter, not so much. I've got a friend who's got a system almost exactly like mine, but he's got a much uh, 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 shallower pitch. His system is way better in the summer. Did I say summer? I, I sorry. I meant um, mine. Mine's better for kind of year round. His is way better in the summer. Um, what's the slope? You need to know that. How much sun exposure do you get? How many solar panels can you install? That's really important. So you want to get an assessment of okay, I've got a couple of uh, sides of my roof. One's paint facing south, another one's facing west. Okay, that's good. The sun's going to be shining on those. How many solar panels can you put on those? And then your production is going to be some something in the range of that uh, 13 to 1400 kilowatt hours per kilowatt. So the reason solar panels are, how many solar panels is important is because um, each of those solar panels is rated. So my solar panels on my roof um, uh, were uh, 255 watts each, okay? And gang together, there was 6.75 or 6, 7,650 watts, okay? That's the number you want. How many watts can you get up there so that you can benefit from the fact that Saskatchewan we get such great data? Okay, the next assessment is your energy usage assessment. This is really important and actually something that can save you money right now. Okay.
Okay, so how much energy, what's your average um, annual household consumption? Look at your 